So anyways, tonight we have um, Bob K1YO continuing his meeting from last week. Um, and I will let Bob explain what he's got. He's going to take it up a level from uh, tools that are good for the shack to useful items, uh, the nano VNA and other stuff. So all yours, Bob. Okay, thanks, Larry. Let me see if I can share this screen. And share. Tell me if you see that coming across, guys. Yes. Okay, I have one real quick thing here. I just want to try something to see if you can hear um, sound coming across too. It should, but let's see. All right, so in a previous video, Hearing that sound? we set up the okay, yes, elliptical. Please. Amen. <laughs> okay. Yep. Great. Something's wrong. Something it's working. All right. So let me, uh, let me full screen here if I can. F five. Uh, F five. Yeah. There we go. That look good. Yep. Looks great. Okay. So I think most of you all don't know me, but um, this is going to be talking about the nano VNA and the tiny essay and um, how to use this for some appropriate things for our uses as hams. So this is not an introductory class at all. However, at the end of the class, I will give you two reference sheets that will list some great locations for videos and for guides that you can use. There's only a couple of them, but they're ones I found on my travels throughout the net. <clears throat> Excuse me. So everybody hear the audio okay? Yeah, you sound good. All right. So generator output of the tiny SA or nano can easily damage your receiver or other equipment that you are testing. See the following pictures. And this presentation tonight is gonna to be comprised of, I think it's six videos that I made. So it's gonna be a couple of slides here and there, but mostly videos to demo for you exactly how to do some of these pretty neat things. So let's get going. Um, and talking about the output of the uh, the tiny SA that we see here, this is the low output at 10 megahertz. And you can see on the scope with the arrow that it's putting out 776 millivolts peak to peak. Here to tell you that if you put that in the back of one of your transceivers, not going to have a very good receiver after that, okay? 5 megahertz, it goes up to 832 millivolts peak to peak output coming out. This is with the generator part because there is a generator built into the spectrum analyzer, which is a good thing to have. And then... If you go from the high output side, 5.4 volts peak to peak at max on that thing. So you really got to be careful. You really have to attenuate, put some attenuators over here on the outputs if you're going to try to run anything into a sensitive unit like your receiver. Okay. Also showing the nano VNA, that's putting out, it doesn't put out as nice a sine wave like the, uh, the tiny SA does, but it puts out 1.3 volts peak to peak at 10 meg, still enough to do some damage for you. You know, when we're used to doing microvolts on the input. So be aware in this, um, you know, in the line here, you can put an attenuator or a variable attenuator. I always start out with about 40 dB of attenuation and crank it down. <clears throat> Excuse me, so I don't blow anything up. All right. What does so, VNA stand for, Bob? The VNA? Oh, I'm sorry. It's a nano. It's tiny. It's yeah. a vector network analyzer compared okay. to like the, uh, you know, the MFJ analyzers we use for the antenna, which are scalar analyzers. The yep. difference is the vector analyzer gives you both the resistance and the, uh, you know, the value of, uh, of voltage, and it gives you the phase of the signal. The other ones don't do that. Very important. We'll see that. Okay. So anybody has questions, pop your hand up. Uh, this may rain a, run a little long tonight, so I'm going to try to keep it going. So for the um, basic, for the tiny SA, what can we use it for? Obviously, for our uses, uh, use it to uh, analyze a signal, the spectrum of your signal, an output signal, for example, and the harmonics. I'm doing this on uh, the Regal, the big spectrum analyzer, and we're going to show doing this on the tiny one too, but this was a little easier to film and show. So you see the mark here is the fundamentals at 5 meg. If I go to the next slide, third harmonic is at 15 meg roughly, and you want to determine the decibel difference between if you've made a transmitter, for example, you've created one. There are limits the FCC puts out as a what they can do per frequency. So this little guy will will do that and measure these two. It's just a little easier to see, and we'll get to that. Okay. So we can also do AM and FM signal viewing. If you have an AM signal, I think this is uh, maybe this is FM. This is an FM signal coming in with one kilohertz of deviation, and you can see the signal and the two sides of it at one kilohertz out. 
uh, this is just a very, very crude representation here, but if you want to see your FM signal going out, you can use this with an antenna on uh, if you're close enough to be able to pick that up. Right now, the 1R is a marker. You'll see this multiple times through these videos, and it's at 10 megahertz, roughly, at minus 53 dBm. So 0 dBm on the top line down to minus, I'm sorry, 0 B here for this one, and minus 53 dBm. <coughs> So uh, that is your FM signal. If you want to look at your AM signal, you can do it. Uh, this is just coming out of, uh, both of these are just coming out of one of my uh, function generators. So I'm cranking an AM signal into there at uh, one kilohertz at 50% depth. This will let you look at your AM output if that's what you're transmitting that. And you can see you know, the depth of your signal here. You don't want to get down to the baseline, but there's a lot to be said about that. I'm not going to cover it here, but you can do those nice functions with this analyzer. Any questions um, before we move on here? Okay, how about some demo videos or video demos? All right, this is Tiny Spec Analyzer Video 1, characterizing a high pass filter. I'm gonna do this on, uh, and it's five minutes and 20 seconds long. I'm gonna do this on the big Regal first. So those of you that haven't done this can easily see how to do it. Then I'm gonna show you how to do it on the $60 Tiny, uh, tiny SA. So here we go, a little bit of luck. Hopefully you can hear it. Hello everybody. As a lead in to characterizing filters using the tiny spectrum analyzer, I thought it might be helpful to take a look at full-blown uh, spectrum analyzer here that's got a tracking generator built in. And what that means is this analyzer will put out a frequency on this port that can go directly into this port. This is the output port of the generator. This is the spectrum analyzer's input port. And then it'll characterize it on the screen. So what we're going to do is, if you can see over here, that's just a filter that I built a while ago. It's a 7 megahertz high pass filter. You can probably pan over there a touch and you can see the input and the output of the filter. And basically, it's in the line right between these two ports. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up the spectrum analyzer to use the tracking generator and sweep it <coughs> from roughly 1 to 10 megahertz and take a look what the display looks like. So bear with me, we'll do that. We'll do a frequency, start frequency of 1 megahertz, a stop frequency of 10 megahertz. So you have the trace coming across the bottom, and I'm not going to get too concerned about calibrations and all that, but just because this is a little bit of a demo. And just to show that you can do the same thing with the tiny SA, although not as easy. So what we're going to do now, see if I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, I'll, I'll do this first. We'll set up the tracking generator, turn it to on, and what you're going to see now is the curve trace that comes across to a specific frequency and then rolls off to here and you have a dB level on the left hand side of the chart here. The stronger the signal the closer it is to 0 dB or whatever but higher is stronger. So let me see if I can zoom in here quickly and get a little better shot of the display itself. Okay we're back. I hope that little zoom here will help you out. I've had to stop the autofocus so it doesn't keep focusing on my hand here. But we can see on the trace that we have a stop frequency of 10 megahertz. At the bottom of this, left and right, you can see the start frequency, the stop frequency, the resolution bandwidth, for example, which we can talk about <coughs> later if we need it. But we just note that the tracking generator is on. And if we put markers on, which is uh, on this machine, turn the markers on the side and you'll see the marker come up right there. That's number one. I'm going to move it down. So right at this point where it starts arcing up, we're at minus 68 or 69 dB. We'll take it up to where it levels off up in here. That's about uh, minus 22 dB. So roughly 70 minus 22, probably around 50 dB of roll off on this on this high pass filter, meaning if their signal is below 7 megahertz roughly, they could be knocked down by 50 dB or more. 
and this filter was built to to test another ham's location because he had some signals coming in around three or four megahertz or lower that were killing some of his uh, receive functions. So we threw this thing together. It's an elliptical filter and it does have a pretty good roll off, only a couple of parts <coughs> in it. So just bear in mind, this is what we're going to try to duplicate on the tiny spectrum analyzer. This machine, uh, the Regal, uh, the 815, DSA 815, very nice machine, digital machine. They're coming down quite nicely in price, but nowhere near the $60 or $59 that the tiny spectrum analyzer would cost. So we're going to jump back and and uh, try to do the same thing, except we do not have a tracking generator built in to the tiny SA. We're going to use an external sweep generator or function generator to generate a 1 meg to 10 megahertz signal and then put that um, into the tiny SA just like we're doing here. So we're going to fake it out and pretend we have a tracking generator uh, that we can use. And you can get some function generators fairly inexpensively, even some chips or or small assemblies on uh, on eBay or on even on Amazon these days. So you guys can duplicate the functions of this spectrum analyzer and a pretty good shot we'll show you uh, with the tiny spectrum analyzer, TSA. This guy goes from 9 kilohertz to 1.5 gigahertz. Tiny SA goes up to fairly much the same. The newer ones actually um, go up to 6 gigahertz, the Ultra, Tiny SA Ultra. So just keep that in the back of your heads. We'll talk to you soon. 73K1YO. Okay. Next video up is same thing. This time and from here on, we'll be using the Tiny SA and the small devices like the Nano VNA to show you how you all can do the same things without having a high-end spec analyzer there. So this is the same high-pass filter. Here's another video, and the video is seven minutes long. Just so if you're falling asleep, you'll know the end is coming shortly, okay? All right, so in a previous video, we set up the elliptical seven megahertz high-pass filter and showed you what it looked like through a Regal spectrum analyzer. That analyzer had a tracking generator built into it, which made it pretty easy to visualize that filter. Using the tiny SA here, we're going to do the same thing. It's a little more difficult, but it's not that difficult. What we're going to try to do is try to match, for lack of a better term, the output of the um, function generator, which is right now set to sweep from 1 kilohertz to 10 megahertz uh, and it's going to sweep at uh, 5 seconds so it's a 5 second sweep so what we have to do is come into the tiny SA first thing to do is set up the frequency range and this should be calibrated first so I'm not going to go through that you all probably know how to do that and it should be done before you start any real measurements just to make sure they're accurate so go in here and touch um, actually it would look like this it would look like frequency, so you touch the frequency, start frequency of 1 megahertz, touch the display again, go a stop frequency of 10 megahertz. That's pretty much what we're interested in. You'll see that it's changed the display and it shows the start frequency down here of 1 meg and the stop frequency of 10 meg. And what we want to do at this point, we can really start the spectrum, I'm sorry, the function generator. So here it is, it started up and it is sweeping. You can see it coming across and getting big there. You do not have the type of display on, or that was shown previously on the spectrum analyzer with the tracking generator. So what we're going to do is try to set this up to match as best we can and get the same thing. And that's done basically by going in and looking into, if you're looking at the main menu, you're looking into display what does this whole thing for us is a thing called calc calculations. So I pick calc and then you want to pick this max maximum hold function. Now you'll see it starts storing it and it stores the shape of the function that it's sweeping. It's, it takes a while to catch up and build itself. You can help it along a little bit by looking at the sweep settings. Uh, it is a fast sweep. That's what you want it set to. If you put it to normal, you'll have more gaps in there. But it's basically building itself up here. Okay, you could try a couple things, but 
you'll see, we'll go back to the main display, that it is <coughs> showing a full, pretty much a full sweep or a full graph chart like the Regal Spectrum Analyzer showed. If I can grab this little marker here and drag it around a little bit, which will put it up to the top where it flattens out, this marker is now shown by the information that is up here in the upper left hand side. So it shows about at about 6.88 megahertz. It's at minus 45 dB, dBm actually. So what we can see by going back is this filter really drops off to minus 93 dBm. So that's almost 50 dB of attenuation the filter does. So basically that allows everything roughly above 7 megahertz. If we put this up to around 7 see that's about right around there. It's tough to do with a pencil. Much easier to do this stuff with the software which I'll show you also. But you can do it right on the display. You can use the little up on the top part here there's a little uh, click wheel that you can go back and forth on this too and I'll do that and you can move you can move the marker that way but it's easier to do it on screen. So what we've seen is you have a pretty nice chart that is derived and built up by clicking a couple of the functions on here and setting things so that they work off the function generator, the sweep that's coming out. Now, it would be sensible, even smart, to go back here and let me go back to the main setup and look at presets. Okay, Presets let you, if I can keep it on there, presets let you load and store uh, the settings for the whole function, or for the whole spectrum analyzer in one position. So what we're going to do is we're going to push store and everything that's set up the way it is and that's giving us a good phrase, I'm going to store on position number four here. Okay, so now that's stored. Now if you came back to the loads and loaded it, it would load the same thing for you and come back. All right, And it would have to build up the thing again. I made a few of these the other day in testing this, so if I look at preset for example load number one that looks a little different. That's using a storage trace from before, so you can put additional traces on here to compare what you're taking currently to what maybe you had before you changed a filter or antenna or whatever. So you do have the capability to make um, uh, basically comparisons on here. All right, so one more thing we want to talk about is the potential to have a waterfall in here. So I'm going to go back to the trace that we had before, the preset, and uh, load in number four that we had. Let it build up for a second again. And you can go in there with the display settings and change the sweep speed here and some of the fast speeds. There's a couple points you can set in there to make this happen a little quicker. You see this is happening pretty quickly. The red trace, if you can see it coming across the bottom, is the actual signal and it's making a pretty nice trace. We talked about basically about the little marker and you can have multiple markers on here. You also can have, if you go back to the display, you can have a waterfall. Touch that and you'll see the actual waterfall signal. As it sweeps you will see it come across diagonally on the waterfall. Some of you are probably familiar with PSK31 and some of the digital modes where you have waterfall displays on the software. You can do the same thing with this. Not that it's very useful for what we're trying to do, but it's just something you can do, just FYI. So I'm going to go back, and I'm, oops, I didn't turn off the waterfall, so I will. It's a little tough to touch this because I'm coming around a camera and a couple other things to get this pointer in there for you. But just wanted to show you a few of the things you can do on the Tiny SA, Tiny Spectrum Analyzer, just to characterize some filters that you may have built and one of the tests. All right, we'll get back to you with some more videos. Thanks, 73K1YO. Okay, let's jump on the same thing, but same filter characterization using the software. Much, much neater to work with, I think. Another seven minutes, then we can take a, a breather if you want. Looks like our time is doing pretty good. But uh, same thing here. Hello, everybody. It's Bob, K1YO. And I promised you that I would do a short video on the software that's available for the TinySA as freeware. 
it's pretty good, pretty functional, and, and very useful. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is is a tiny essay, of course. It's just a video of the screen itself. If you look at this, you can see that our start and stop frequencies are listed across the bottom. I've chosen 88 meg and 108 meg, which is the FM band as start and stop frequencies because there's some signals here locally for me. Uh, there is a marker on here. It says it's at 108 meg, so you can see it way up here in the corner. I'll see if I can drag that out to make it a little more visible for you. There we go. And we'll stick it on this high frequency. So that marker is telling us then we're looking at a frequency of 102.1, which is a local FM station here, a very strong one. The level of that particular signal is minus 67 or so dBm. It's moving because they're broadcasting, obviously. And this is all nice, and it's small. You know, we've gone through this tiny essay on uh, on some of the other videos. But basically, what we can do, with much more functionality-wise, is to use software. So I'm going to switch with this OB Studio here that I'm using here over to a window capture. So that you put up the window, and let me get into that window for you, uh, of the Tiny SA application. It's called Tiny SA-App. And the program, it's going to be tinysa-app.exe is the program that you're going to run when you go to use it. <coughs> Excuse me. So right now, there's nothing going on. You'll see up here that we're hooked to COM10. And basically, that is the COM port, USB port, uh, that the Tiny SA is plugged into. I know that. You guys probably have figured out over the years of how to get in and find what COM port, USB port you're using. Basically device manager in Windows because this is a Windows program right now. And you can look at what devices are listed there, then plug in the tiny SA and then see if it put a new COM port on for you and that's the one to use. So it defaults out to this um, the baud rate. Um, so basically it's COM10, don't worry about the baud rate. It's disconnected, so you're not seeing anything. But you'll see here at the bottom of the screen, it's gone from 88 meg to 108, 108 meg, just like the tiny SA is. And you can reconfigure that right here in software too. 88 to 108 center frequency calculates for you. Then a span if you want it. Uh, how many data points? Typically, you're going to be like 100, 400 data points. That gives you pretty well. I believe you can go higher on that. Uh, nope, I take it back. That's highest you can go and that's pretty good actually. The other stuff is bandwidths, resolution bandwidth and stuff. And then there's calculations and markers you can do down here which you can read about on the program. So I'm not going to go into depth on that because uh, we just want to show you how to use this. What you're going to have to do obviously is first of all connect this device into the software program itself. So you'll see it's disconnected up here. You kick that and it's now connected. Still not doing anything because you have to sweep it or scan it. So right over here, sort of hidden away, is a scan series of commands. That's a single sweep or a single scan. This is continuous. This lets you record it. And it's doing log power versus linear. It helps to use the log in DBMs. Easier to visualize. So we're going to start running a regular sweep on it. And you'll see there it is down there. It's active. And if I go down and take a look at these, we put that marker on the tiny SA right here on 102.1s, and that's where it sits. But you can change the marker even in the software. You know, move it back and forth and so on and so forth. Um, which is interesting because you can get readings on anything particularly you want to use. So you see we put a red marker on here. And up here it gives that live marker frequency and the signal strength. This is going to be useful for you when you want to do measurements. All right. So let's see. Is there anything else? Oh, yes. There is one thing that's really well hidden here. You'll see it. You can save this image. You can save the data. But right here, you'll see this little new graph bar. And I'm going to punch that. But to do this, I'm going to have to go and look at this program as part of a full screen here because it only does one window at a time unless I spec another window. So I'm going to go do a display capture, which shows you everything on my screen. And I'm going to choose this guy here now, go full screen with it. You should still be back to the tiny app, but now I can come and pick that particular graph, put a new graph on there, and you'll see it pops up a graph for us. 
it lets you choose a pile of graphs here. Uh, Smith charts, log mag of um, S1, S1, or S11 rather, or S21. We talked and did some of these things in some other videos. Uh, there's a pile of stuff here you can use. Uh, you can use the Smith chart, which is interesting that it can do that on on the tiny SA, which is very useful. Uh, but I'm just going to put it on log mag S21. Uh, just for, and it gives you again the same type of things. You can look at the markers. You can look at the frequency range, etc. Okay, so just so you know, that's there because they do hide it very well. All right, so you can save things. It's it's very good software, very useful. Uh, down at the bottom, you have uh, where the markers are and what they were specifically at this point in time. And you can jump back and forth to them if you want down here. And then you can load them. You can you can save the markers. Uh, all kinds of stuff you can do. Average for number of sweeps. Put some attenuation in here if you want to knock it down by oh I don't know. Uh, 26 dB. You can throw the attenuation, and you'll see things go way down to baseband. So we're going to do, we're just going to do auto on the attenuation here. But all kinds of options for you, okay? Which is very good. I, I never noticed trying uh, zero attenuation. See what happens. Not much. Okay. Now there it is. It's sort of clean. Not bad looking. But I'm going to just put it back on auto and get out of here. So uh, I wanted to show you this information. Uh, I'm going to drop this thing down and go back on the screen here to the studio and uh, get rid of the studio both the uh, window capture and this whole screen and we're back to the tiny SA which is still chugging away back there nice little device and I hope you're having fun with it again uh, thanks for listening and watching this is K1YO we'll be seeing you soon 7-3couple quick things we talked about on, on the spectrum analyzer there. You did see a calibration uh, mentioned up front. Very easy on this device. There's a little dual SMA cable. You plug it into the two ports, punch calibrate on the screen, and it takes care of it. The spec, the tiny SA, very easy to use. So uh, it, it seemed like it'll be useful for you for doing some of the things we want to do. Okay. So next coming up, um, some functional and useful videos for the nano VNA. We're going to do another high pass filter characterization and software usage on this one. This is 12 minutes long. Very good. Uh, <clears throat> I, I have to apologize for some of the productions because I'm not a video uh, producer. And uh, you'll see me, you'll see the, uh, the pointer moving because I'm Italian and I speak with my hands. So if the pointer's in my hands, the pointer's going to move too. Okay, so, so there it is. But uh, the nano is very important. It does a lot more things than the spectrum analyzer does. And the price is not that much different. Okay, I think they're about $79 now, if I remember right. They may have, you know, they, they have newer ones coming out all the time. So let's take a look at this and we'll keep chunking through this. All right. <clears throat> and then as we go through this, we're going to talk about the Smith chart. I know Jurgen is dying to see this, okay? But um, this is the Nano VNA video, and then here we go. And then we'll get into some regular slides and talking shortly after this. Here we go. Hello, everybody. This is Bob, K1YO. This is the start of a video on the Nano VNA. We're going to take a look at characterizing some filters, in this case, a high-pass filter at 7 meg. When you start up the Nano, this is what it looks like. Pretty ugly. So what I want to get you all to do is to figure out how to get to the trace that you need and what does that do to make sense of you. I'll point out a couple of things. You can see the start frequency on the bottom that's selected uh, and the stop frequency. Then up at the top you see four entries, each corresponding to a different color on the screen and that's the trace color. The M here is for marker number one and it tells you what frequency it's at. And then you'll see, of course, all the traces on there. So what I'm going to do is to show you an important function called recall. Recall zero here is the startup. In other words, the default startup. And yesterday, I was able to do a calibration. And I saved it as recall one. All right. And then that's going to be what's called log mag. So we're going to use this to characterize the actual trace itself. I'm going to go back to the main screen 
and look at the stimulus because this has its own generator in it. I'm going to do a start frequency by touching here of 1 megahertz and then touch again on the screen and do a stop frequency of 15 megahertz. Again, this is a 7 megahertz high pass filter. Then I got to come back here and it's paused the sweep, so we're going to touch that and unpause the sweep and go back. Now you'll see the trace that's on the screen. I'm going to drag the marker down, so looking down here, remember I told you the marker's at about 3.6 meg, the 80 meter band, and as you go up, you can see that basically it's allowing the higher frequency to pass around 7.2 megahertz. Now we can drag the marker using any type of a pointing device. Right now I'm just using a, a pencil. But on the top of the device there's a little jog wheel that will let you move it and you can move the cursor looking at the frequency up here. You can move the cursor as close as you can get to whatever frequency, 7.028 meg. Again, it's measuring at minus 2.65 decibels at 7.028. It'd be interesting to know how much attenuation, for lack of a better term, this filter has. So we're going to drag it down here to the 3 megahertz, 80 meter band, and it's at minus 68. So 68 minus 2 or 3 is about 66 decibels of attenuation. That's pretty good. So this is just one trace that you can use on here. And let me go back to the display because that's where you see all the traces. Right now you'll see trace 1 is the only one on. We can turn it off by touching it on and off again. But let's put trace 0 on. That's the yellow one. And it tells you trace 0 is referring to channel 0. Now those of you that might know a little bit about the VNAs, especially the nano VNA here, channel 0 is the reflected channel. So zero puts a signal out on channel zero and reads the reflected coming back in. So it's basically reflective power. Return loss in this case is what we're looking at. But it's important to look at this this trace for channel uh, one, the log mag trace we just looked at. Let me get back to that one here. Get this guy off. That log mag is coming on channel one which means signals go out channel zero and they come back to the bottom connector on the nano VNA which is channel one. This is an S21 reading. The output of one channel is read by the second channel. That's uh, the S parameter 21. Not that it matters. But again, we can put all these other traces on and let me pop trace zero off here again and let's pick trace trace three. So the trace is chosen, you'll notice. If we go back to the format of the trace, you can then pick what you want to view on that particular trace. In this case, it's the purple trace. We're looking at a Smith chart. We can look at phase. Um, we can look at delay. Not that we want to use those. Or log mag, which is what we were looking at on the other channel. But we'll keep it at Smith chart at this point in time, and we won't have to use that. So I'm going to go back to... Um, just go back to the specific trace and turn it off. Trace 2 again is on here. Uh, remember, the important thing is whatever you have checked, if you go back to the previous screen, then you can change the scale, you can change the format, and you can change what channel is coming in on. you got to know that if you want to do this, this trace of the filter, you want to go through a 21 type, S21, which means you got to use two of the outputs. So you got to look at what's being read on channel 1. A little confusing because they label these things 0 and 1 instead of 1 and 2, but the S parameters are 1 and 2. Go figure. Anyway, so we'll get that thing off of there. But that's the important thing. You can, you can do bandwidths. You, you don't have to do it at this point in time. But again, you can do markers, and there's a bunch of markers on here you can add. In this case, we only have one marker. It's marker 1. But you can put additionals on there if you need it. We can do delta divisions between markers and all that. Okay? So we're going to go back to display, trace. We're going to shut off the green one here, trace 2, and just consider trace 1 here. What I'm going to do at this point, um, again, is jump off of this and go to software. The Nano VNA comes with software for free. It doesn't come with it. You actually have to download it and install it. You install it, then you run it. Uh, and uh, it is called, let's see if I can reach over here and get the actual name of it for you. 
It's called Nano VNA Dash Saver. All right, there's another one out there. This one's a little, uh, a little newer and much better. So what I'm going to do with a little bit of luck here is go back to the main screen here, jump to the video program, and change my video input from uh, the video capture device camera back to the display from which I should be able to show you the screen. Now if this is coming across, <coughs> excuse me, you'll see two traces on here. This is just like the traces we saw on the Nano VNA. Of course they're much easier to read on here. I don't know if you can see my, my cursor on here on the screen, but that top trace is the same thing. That's the characteristics of the filter. The important thing about this program once you run it is you, you establish a start and stop frequency or center frequency just like you do on the Nano and this does it independent from the Nano itself so settings on the Nano aren't going to necessarily be the same as on here but this will control the Nano and for lack of a better term overwrite it. So go on this you want to set your start and stop frequencies you can put a bunch of markers right now uh, we have a red marker out there you can see it up there uh, and you can see the position and there's a blue marker all the marker information will appear here in all of these basic uh, blocks, I guess you could call it. And as you drag that marker around, I'm going to drag the red one, you'll see up on the top here and here, uh, right over here where it's red on the marker information, you'll see that updating to where the marker is. So right here, it's roughly 6.98 meg, 7 meg. Uh, marker 2 is at 0. We can put... You know, you can put marker, whoops, that's marker 1. You can drag marker 2 here uh, and select that one first. Right there, I believe. Marker 3, my mistake. And then you can drag that to the lowest. Then you could do delta calculations between these if you'd like. You can do this on the, the Nano VNA itself too. A little easier to do it on the screen if you need that stuff. So I'm going to go back to the red marker. Get rid of this guy. And let's see if there's any other additional information. This is, again, the, the return loss here. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the, the filter characterization. This is the return loss here. Higher is better. So this shows that there's more attenuation at these frequencies and, and less attenuation. I'm sorry, more attenuation. This is inverse, my mistake. You're probably not going to have to use that. I think for our purposes as hams, we use this to characterize filters you've built and things like that and to look at the sweeps of your antennas. But the, the program makes it easier. The important points are you got to come down here to the bottom to where it says COM and pick the COM port that it identifies your Nano VNA, comes in on USB, and then connect it. Okay, you can manage things. And then display setup's interesting too, that the bottom button here, if you kick that, comes up with this display that says show lines on here instead of just show dots and configurations changing the size of the lines, the thickness, the color and all that stuff. So the basic stuff you'd expect there. Nothing earth shaking there, okay? The important thing is when you come down here um, to do, let's see, right here where it says display charts, you can put up to six charts on this display, on your PC display to look at different things and you choose what the chart is by drop downs here. Okay, there's a pile of them you can do, phases and all that stuff. So we're going to leave it as it is, S21 gain. In our case, we're looking at the attenuation with the filter. That's an important thing to know. The other thing, if you need to do some pretty nice uh, uh, calculations, there's a file section here, <clears throat> and that lets you uh, import a file as a sweep or as a reference file, and then export the file as certain things. Uh, and then you can use those with another free program that's out there to do calculations we will talk about in another video. So just be aware these things are down there. Probably the most important thing with this Nano is whenever you change the frequency sweep range or frequency range, you need to do a recalibration. I'm not going to do that. I did that earlier. Uh, it's a couple of steps. It's not really hard, but there's steps you have to follow. This program also lets you do a calibration. If you look down here, bottom left, you'll see a calibration button. When you click that, it's going to want you to do a short, an open, a load, through calibration and through reflection and then an isolation. So it depends on which ones you want to do. Normally you just do S-O-L-T, okay? And then if you want to do isolation, you connect the two ports together and do that. What this does once you save is it calibrates the nano 
to give you accurate readings, and I'm here to tell you you will not get accurate readings if you don't do a calibration when you change the, the sweep frequency settings, okay? Whether you're using Nano standalone or whether you're using it in the software. Okay, so we'll get back to this. Let me jump back into uh, the studio here and pick up the other video on that and get rid of the display. So we'll pull the video up. And now we should be back to the old Nano display here where we saw our sweep characterization, or our linear character, I'm sorry, our characterization of the filter. I need another cup of coffee. So hopefully uh, this has proven helpful to you. You can use this to test your traps, test your antennas eventually, which we'll talk about, and to see if any filters you've made are working the way it should. We'll be back with another video shortly. 7-3 for now, K1YO. Okay, so we're going to keep going on the Nano, but I wanted to jump onto this because the Smith chart function of the Nano VNA is something that can be very, very useful to us. And people quiver when they hear Smith charts. I'm still quiver when I hear it. But if you want to do the full Smith chart like they did 30 years ago, you got to be crazy because you could do it on software a lot easier. So let me show you. <clears throat> uh, this is not a video. This is me live. Okay. Here is uh, my idea of a Smith chart. Here's a couple important things to remember. If you look at this line that goes all the way across the center of the Smith chart, <clears throat> that's a resi resistive line. Remember we said that the VNA does, uh, you know, does the J, the complex impedances, and it does other things. This is a purely resistive line, and it goes from a short where it intersects this side of the circle to infinity or open where it intersects this side. And when you calibrate your VNA, uh, you can tell it 50 ohm, 70 ohm, whatever. You set that 50 ohm point to right here on this, this circle, all right? So this is a 50 ohm circle. Um, the important thing to remember here is anything above this red line here, this horizontal line is inductive reactance, okay? So it's inductor. Anything below it, if your points come down there, is capacitive reactance. Anywhere on that 50 ohm circle, important to know this point, anywhere on the circle is 50 ohms, but it might be 50 ohms with you know, 25 nano Henry's or you know, 50 ohms with a J value that you've probably seen of, of you know, 110 uh, nano farads or whatever. This system will call that out for you. But just remember, this is a pure resistance circle for 50 ohms. This one, I believe, is 25. This one is 12 and a half, you know, and so on and so forth. The one we're concerned with in all our stuff because of our systems is the 50 ohm. So the thing you need to remember very simply, above the line is inductive. Below that line is capacitance. I always remember by its C, and the C is under <laughs> the horizon usually, okay? All right, so any questions on that? I know, uh, you know, I'm not going to get in depth. Well, I can't get in depth because I don't know much more about the Smith chart. I mean, you could probably spend 10 days. I know jurgen has got that 4,000 uh, segment chart that he loves to look at. But those guys back in the day surely did a great job at it. But this is important in using the Nano VNA to tune your antenna. So if you stick the Nano in place of your transceiver and bring your antenna right to it, first of all, short the static off your antenna. Okay, <laughs> don't make that mistake too. Uh, but uh, this is about eight and a half minutes. It's very, uh, a very useful video. Just remember, if I say impedance, I mean inductance. I, it, like I said, I need another cup of coffee then while I was making these things over the past couple of weeks. So here we go with using the Nano to tune an antenna. Okay, we're going to try this video, folks. <clears throat> I have this coming on a video from a cell phone. But what we have is the VNA kicked in. If we look at it, it's set up to do a Smith chart. And down here it says the start frequency is 1 meg. I don't know if you can read this top frequency is 30 meg. And there's a marker on here. You can see the little green one right in here. But you'll see this thing sweeping all around because that's going from 1 to 30 meg. What I wanted to try to show here is adjustment of an antenna tuner using the VNA. This is, uh, yeah, the nano VNA rather. And this is on a true antenna. This is an antenna to my station. So the first thing I'm going to do, I want to try to shoot it for about, oh, 3.944 meg. So the first thing I'm going to do is tap on the screen and go to, it would look like this, okay? 
it would look like you tap on the screen, you go to stimulus, give a start frequency of let's say one, let's say three meg for the 75 meter band, three megahertz, and then do a stop frequency of say four megahertz. And you'll see that trace go down a bit, go down significantly as a matter of fact. All right, just remember on these Smith charts, this horizontal line going across goes from a short on this side where it intersects the circle and on this side it represents a uh, uh, infinity or an open okay and above the line is basically uh, the impedance okay coils Stop. and below the line is uh, capacitance all right so if you look at the marker right now it's showing um, and it's coming in to channel zero of the Smith chart um, it's reading 24.65 ohms at 5.9 mic microfarads because it's below the line the marker is here all right so what I'm going to try to do here is if I can let's see if I can scoot up a bit here and show you what we're talking about there is the antenna tuner AT2K basically and really it's just got a coil and two caps I'm going to try to get back gracefully to the uh, this is all by hand now folks so give me <laughs> give me some mercy gracefully to the Smith chart on the nano okay we're pretty close and I'm going to come up here on the actual um, antenna tuner above and I'm going to tune one of the caps and basically not much going on there not much going on there when I crank the coil crank the impedance of the coil nothing and the reason for that is because I don't have the antenna tuner in line, it's direct. So it's looking at the antenna. <clears throat> so if I'm going to switch the antenna tuner to direct, okay, now you'll see, whoops, I'm sorry, you'll see a different trace over here. Now the marker's at 6.8 ohms at 10.9 microfarads. It's still a little capacitive, the antenna needs a little inductance. Now if I take and crank these um, capacitors, here's one, I want to get down to that 50 ohm line there, which it's getting, and to a 50 ohm line by doing the other cap. And sometimes you only have one cap. Now what we have to do, obviously, we're looking at 5.5 uh, ohms at 18 nanofarads up here. We really want to get this back to this intersection point. This is 50 ohms. Again, that's a, a short. This intersection is open. Where this circle intersects the line is the 50 ohm point. If you've normalized your, your system for that, which I think it comes as that default. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to crank the inductor in here up and down and see. Well, okay, now we're up into the inductance. And you can see if we, if we tweak both of them, we can get more inductance. I'm sorry, we can get closer to the line. I'm cranking the inductor there, and now I'm tuning one of the capacitors to get back to line. And if you look, it's pretty easy. We're now up to 13 ohms up here. All right, so we're getting close. So if I crank the inductor up, hopefully some more, and then tweak it again, we'll get up in there. And I got to play with two different captures. So it's really a game of getting close in, and here it comes, it's coming in, close in with the caps, and just using this as as your rig effectively and um, let's see I'm gonna give it a little more inductance if I can and we'll see if it's going we'll see it's going down so I'm gonna try to crank this thing it's not easy with one hand here sometimes until it's sort of oh there it goes you see how it's going in there so I'm cranking it cranking it it's getting very close I still have a little bit too much capacitance I'm gonna try to tweak that so the capacitance comes out of that if you look interesting thing if you look up into the top you'll see we're at 42 ohms, we're getting close, at 2.75 nanofarads. So it tells you what the capacitance of this point is, and if there was inductance, if this was up above, it would show the inductance. So you can get this um, to, to get close. The thing has a bit of a curve here because you're sweeping from 3 meg to 4 meg. Let me, let me put in an actual frequency. The net I normally run on will do a CW frequency, which means this thing is a generator, can put out one frequency of 3 decimal nine four four I think we got that megahertz all right now you see a point on there because it's not sweeping when it's sweeping you'll see it going around and the, the higher the span of the bandwidth here 
that you're sweeping, the more curves you're going to see as it goes through the frequencies. So now if we tweak this, it should be a little easier possibly to see. Oh, look at that. We're getting very close. Still gives you a reading. We're at 40, 48.750 ohms. And we need a little more inductance, I think, to get it up right there. Okay. Bring a little in with the capacitance. And we're pretty darn close to 49.3, 50.4 ohms. So we're 50.4 ohms. We can get that 5 nanofarads out of there too. I just want to use this as illustration for you. The other thing we can do on this, see if I can do this quick and dirty, is we go back to um, go back to the display and pick that trace we're using, trace number number 2 it is, and it's checked. The interesting thing is you can turn your traces on and off right here by touching and touching again, uh, and then whatever one is selected with the checkbox that means if you go back to the main menu there, you can then format that trace for different kinds, change the scale, change the channel, channel 0 up there or channel 1. Right now we're coming in on channel 0, the reflected channel, which is what we use for this. But let's see if we change this format just for grins to SWR, which it does for you. Okay, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, SWR here is 1.15 to 1. Let's see if I crank this thing and see how it changes. Look at that, okay, the SWR, again, we're only at one point. Let me look at a different sweep here. So if I do the stimulus and go from, where were we, like 3 to 4 meg or so, we'll do a start frequency of 3 meg, and then a stop frequency of, say, 5 meg even, okay. Now we have a trace, there's our marker. Now as we change the inductor here, I'm just quick on the inductor, you see that marker coming down to peak on the bottom of nicely SWR of 1.07 I think it says um, to 1. That's how you could use this to tune your antennas. I hope this is helpful and by the way you still have the the um, oh it's the SWR, it doesn't give you the, the microfarads and all that stuff but it does tell you the frequency uh, the frequency right now is 3.94544, and that's how you can tune it. Changing the capacitors, you will see, does change the position of the marker on the SWR because you're, tar you're targeting for 3.944 meg or whatever you want. So I hope this helps, and uh, we'll get back with potentially some other videos, but I really wanted to get this to you so you can see how to use the Nano VNA as um, a Smith chart and as an SWR chart just to get your antennas tuned directly on your station. All right, hope this helps. We'll talk to you all soon, 73 of this. Okay, we're gonna try this. Okay, important thing for that. Um, I didn't may, uh, manage to get into the video, but when the inductive reactance is zero and the capacitive reactance is zero and you have 50 ohms there, that's resonance. So that's what you're striving for, okay? And this one, you know, it's a little easier, I think, to tune using this thing than using, for example, the, the MFJ269 or something, you're doing the same thing. This thing will show you a span and it will show you if it's capacitive or inductive and it'll show you if you have multiple resonance on the, you know, on the same antenna. So interesting for you. And uh, this is, I believe the last video, uh, this could be pretty helpful too. And it's sort of neat, but we're gonna measure some components about seven minutes worth with the Nano VNA. Never knew you could do that with this. It's something I learned in, in uh, doing the studies for this. So here we go with this one. Hey folks, Bob Kamen Wyo. With this short video, I'm going to try to show you how you can measure some components using your Nano VNA. Typically, small inductors and, and capacitors. We'll stick with the capacitors since I do have them available. There's a couple ways to do these things. Uh, normally, you would be looking at using a fixture which I'll try to get into the picture here so you can see it. There it is. You can buy those on the internet. That's the best way to do it. You can make your own fixture. We, fixture, we talked about this last week using these two little uh, no-tooth alligator clips, uh, two SMA connectors on the board. So those fixtures are probably the best way to do this, but uh, I've seen on the internet, and we certainly can give it a shot here, that we are able to, to use a cable with two alligator clips on the end. You can see over here, I'm not sure if you can see it, but that comes into port channel zero, port port one or channel zero on the Nano VNA. So we use this to grab onto our component. 
first thing I want to do in any case is to go back here and um, what you'll see is you will see uh, starting up here you'll see the stimulus we want to set the stimulus for the frequency range we anticipate and I've been hearing that we should start around 10 kilohertz and then maybe stop it at oh maybe 10 or so megahertz to put the trace up there then what we want to do is make sure that we're all looking at channel 0 which is where we're hooked up on these little indicators up here okay there's our marker and all that now we definitely want to calibrate for that frequency range so we're going to go back here and hit calibrate <coughs> and then hit calibrate again then the first thing I'm going to do um, is as uh, soon as it stops doing it that is first thing I'm going to do is go back and reset any calibrations that are in here then we hit calibrate then we do open you hit it and we're going to be doing an open just by holding these things open that's done then we're going to take the two leads clip the buggers together and then punch short just touch the short and that will do a calibration for shorted leads and there it is and then it's asking to put a load on there so what I have at this point in time which is pretty you know pretty close I use a 15.50.1 ohm uh, load a resistor inside of a PL259 that's what we're going to use for the load so we'll do that for the calibration and that should come up and internally calibrate and then tell it you're done and then we're going to save it as say save number three for example okay fine now what we have to do is come in here and put our component on there so I'm going to clip on this little oh what is it a 10 nanofarad capacitor from the uh, from a kit that uh, we got from the internet here so that little guy is on there and as long as it's not shortened together you'll see it sticking on there tiny one and then what we're going to do is look at this and say all right what do we have here we have a log mag coming back which we're not really going to use we have the Smith chart that's on here and then we have this phase 90 degree phase thing so the interesting thing here is we want to be able to look at um, oh um, where basically you will see the phase switch from upper to lower let me go up to like 50 meg and see if it makes a difference here just so we can demonstrate okay so you see right on the trace this guy here where the phase sweeps it goes straight up and then comes back down again that's the point you want to avoid okay and if we get the marker onto that point with a little bit of luck here you'll see the frequency is 10 megahertz so we want to do our work maybe below 10 megahertz maybe above we'll go below first and see what it looks like so I'm going to set up the stimulus frequency from Oh, let's say 100 kilohertz up to stop frequency of maybe 5 megahertz and let's see what that looks like and what we have is on the green trace here if you can see it you'll see the marker and that Smith chart is has a plot on it and this is for our capacitor here's the trick up here where you see the phase now it's at a minus 169 degrees where where it's sitting the, the measurement is sitting we want to get that measurement and that phase down to minus 90 degrees on the Smith chart and if this was an inductor you'd be trying to set it to a plus 90 degrees now remember as we talked about the <coughs> middle of the Smith chart that line is just a resistant pure resistance line and then above that is inductor reactance below that's capacitive reactance and then these circles in between are ohm circles so this point right here is 50 ohms exactly and starting here you have a dead short and on this side of the circle on that line is infinite or open all right so what we want to do is get this this number here this phase angle to I'm going to try to do it up on top with a little with a little cursor wheel I can drag it I guess but this isn't too bad there it goes you see how it's coming down towards the bottom there you see if we can see that yeah we see that on the screen here so we're going to get it so that this value here is at minus 80, 88 degrees. I want to get it to minus 90 degrees. 
whoops, and I just went past it. If we can't get it, then we can narrow down. You know, the frequency is at 345 kilohertz. We can go back and do a start of, say, 300 kilohertz. And then a stop frequency of, say, 400 kilohertz. And that should narrow it down. Uh, and then you can probably get it to 90 degrees a little easier. 91, I think I'm going the wrong way. Yep, maybe not. No, we're getting there, I think. 90, it's tough with these eyes. 90.6, 90.5. There it is. So we're just about there, 89.9 degrees. There's 90 degrees. Now, what you want to do at that point is come up and look at the Smith chart up here, and it's going to say we're reading 9.44 nanofarads. Okay, it's a little bit off because we have this long cable on there, although we calibrated it out, but we're measuring that at 337 kilohertz. So that folks, is the value of your capacitor. You know, the capacitor on the package that it came in was marked at um, 10 nanofarads, and indeed, it's at 9.44 nanofarads. So, hope this helps. Shows you how you can do inductors and, uh, and capacitors using your nano VNA. Thanks, 73K1YO. Okay, <clears throat> that's it. Um, so, I hope we gave you some inputs and some ideas on how to use the functionality of these two little devices uh, for a couple of things that we can do for ourselves. There is a lot more to do for this uh, with these things. And what I'm going to do, I don't have them. Yeah, maybe I can show them to you here. Stand by one second. Uh, I'll share something else here if I can. Just to show you what I will, uh, whoops, what I will post on. Um, hey folks, Bob, can you oops, I need to do that. Too many keyboards. There we go. So uh, what I'm going to try to do is get the share up. I do have here somewhere um, two sheets that we will post. And I guess, Larry, we can put them up on um, on uh, somewhere here on uh, places where you store things. And I think it's right here. There it is. Okay. So can you see this at this point? Yeah. All right. Well, so, we get the list. Yeah. Okay. So right now I have two guides that I've made up for all of you. One on the tiny SA, which I should be able to should be able to see, I think, or no, is it up? Not yet. Okay, all right. So I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to share that screen, which is I could find it. No, I can't. I cannot locate it for some reason. Okay. Well, trust me, it's there. But what this is going to do is. Um, give you a reference for the tiny essay of a bunch, you know, three or four excellent videos um, for beginners all the way up to high-end users and the same thing with the nano VNA. And I'm going to try, let me stop this share. Let me see if I can pull this thing up just to show you what they look like. Okay, I have it up on the screen. If I share again, I should be able to grab that and pull that up right there. Okay. That's the one that should come up. Okay, so this is for the tiny SA. Should be coming up now, I guess, right? Yep. Okay, so you'll see the main documentation source. Everything for the tiny SA is here. Okay, the best web video series that I've found is Tiny Intraday SA Introduction and Tiny SA First Use by this guy, Eric Kashok. Just look that up using Google or whatever. This guy uh, has a whole series of videos. He's one of the uh, designers, the original design team for this. So he's got a whole series of videos. And on this document, they're going to be sorted by a new user, new loser, okay. a new user, uh, first use introduction, exploring how you do the frequency, all the way down to, and I have some comments on here, all the way down to experience using calibrating high input, signal identification, uh, very good, very good um, uh, videos particularly and i've done the same thing for uh, the nano vna so you have um, basically some excellent references here that you can walk yourself through and take a look at and um, they will work with you there's one excellent one for the nano vna also it's pa3a the guy's name is harry he has got a seven segment or a seven series document that shows you some really high-end things with the nano vna and, and pretty easy to follow so I wanted to get those into one place for you all. And these videos are up here. I guess uh, they can look them up if somebody wanted to use this from, you know, from scratch. 
And uh, if we need more things, we can we can somewhere down the line do another uh, shared knowledge and let me know if there's something you'd like to see on this when you look at some of the references and maybe we can put some together. Okay, not too bad, Larry, 11 minutes over. That's all I have. Thanks everybody. Thanks for not falling asleep and uh, you know, we'll turn it back over to the boss. All right. Sounds good, Bob. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, you can raise a hand and I think you stymied them, Bob. <laughs> oh, wait. Vanessa has a question. Go ahead, Vanessa. Yes, I have a question. Uh, do you have a YouTube channel? I have. Yeah, I think I have one that's still there from from SEC days uh, that I used to use when, you know, from the team. So we might be able to do that and, and pop some of these things up. But uh, I don't know, Larry. What do you save? Where do you save the you know these videos? Um, actually, you probably don't have to go through this whole video. But what you're saying, I think, Vanessa, is can I throw a couple of these up there on uh, on a YouTube channel? Yeah, I, I should be able to do that. Well, you could do that on your channel, or you can, if you want, you, you can provide them to us, and we'll put them on the HCRA. It's up to you. You know which yeah. way you want to go. Just be advised. I mean, the, some of these tools look see, uh, pretty prohibitive and and complex. They they. In some areas they are, in some areas they're very, very useful, I found. You know, tuning your antenna, uh, tuning, you know, using one of those charts to see the, the band pass of a filter you make, or uh, one of the things I was trying to get done, but it was just too long to get in here, was how to identify um, ferrite cores, is it what type it is by using the nano VNA. There's information on those uh, documents I've given you on videos on how to do that. So if you need to, you know, you got a box of the, uh, cores or something you want to see what they are it is you know you can do it uh the thing i didn't put on because you have to use a second program as a calculator to take the results of the nano vna and, and get inputs and uh, that that comes from Fairright, so it's a good company and they they are pretty pretty good at uh, showing how to use some of these things okay other questions uh, i just want to add to what i said that anytime you feel you know, you, you should feel free if you have videos that you want us to put on the HCRA sure. YouTube channel, you know, because you have the equipment, you have the knowledge, you know, and you are willing to share. Thanks. Yeah, I got the equipment now. And I find it took me about a week and a half to figure out how to use the video. <laughs> it was something else. But, uh, you know, it's there. It's usable. And uh, I'm not a video producer, but I'll be glad to do it. If you guys and girls need something on these two units, so let me know. We'll dig around for it, and we'll see if we can put something together. I hesitate to do this live because uh, you, you've seen the lab, uh, some of you, and it just, you know, things can go south real easy and sideways down there, you know, power <laughs> failure or anything else, and, and just trying to fit around some of the test equipment. But, uh, you know, at least with the video, I'm able to get it on there in a, in a reasonable fashion and the correct fashion. Okay. Yeah. What what she's saying too, Bob, is is uh, instead of doing another share the knowledge, um, yeah, uh, is to just make a video and she'll post it up there and it'll accompany or uh, be a, a uh, you know connected to this video or uh, uh, what's some words? Um, yeah, you guys probably know most of you secondary. that I'm a tech, tech specialist for Western Mass. I'll be glad to do that. Uh, just let me know what you need, and then we I'll uh, post that up there and we'll get it through to I guess through Larry or through to uh, Vanessa through zero beat or something or Vanessa or yeah, but website yeah that uh, you know that will do this so if there's things you'd like to take a look at let me know what they are I'll see if I could dig up the background information reference stuff and present you with a video that shows you and then gives you a reference so you don't have to go chasing all over the web on it cool cool anybody else have any uh, questions so so Bob the uh Bellon or the, or the Anon I built for the NFET antenna. I should be able to measure that, but before I, before I feel really yes, put you it can. on the And typically yeah. with the balance and things like that, you know, you, you want to see mm. what what frequencies, because it's a, a ferrite, you want to see what frequencies it cuts off at. I, I might be able to get that while my mouth is flapping. I just saw it two minutes ago. When you use um, the calculator I told you about, uh, the company, which is in this case ferrite, publishes, if I could put my fingers on it, they publish a chart. There it is. Okay. Well, I don't know if you can see that and read it easily, but this is from Fairright. <clears throat> and they publish a chart. So if it's type 43, uh, it should it should show uh, between, uh, it's going to do a resonance, which you'll see with the phase at around 100 megahertz or so, or whatever you come up with the resonance. So say you go through the calculator with the figures, that is provided to you from the nano VNA. 
and you come up with 115 meg or something, you can see which of these, you know, which of these ferrite mixes that typically it should be. Okay, so it's there. It would would have taken a, a lot of video to do that stuff. It's there. It's not crazily difficult. It's not the easiest thing to do, but you can check. Um, you know, you can check your cores out. Yeah, uh, you're going. You can look at the cores. What I've done uh, was taken some ferrites, wrapped a turn um, around it, and looked at the sweep and see what what frequency it passed, uh, and then do two turns to see what the dB attenuation is, do three turns, and it's about 12 dB per turn, I can't, which surprised me. But you can see if you're designing something for a particular frequency, you can see by putting the number of turns on and measuring it, what the attenuation is between X frequency and Y frequency, if that's the band you want to do. So yeah, you know, we can talk about that. We can, uh, you know, we can throw a video together too, if that's uh, something important to you guys. But there's a lot of things you could do with it. These are neat little tools for 60 or 80 bucks, you know, and the uh, uh, it's uh, much better than spending the 14000 for the, the old HP vector network analyzer, which I have one in the basement, too. I didn't pay that. <laughs> it's there, but uh, I like to be able to carry it in your hand. It's pretty nice. Okay, well, thanks for your attention. Wait, other... uh, John has a question. Uh, Where John? Go ahead, John. Um, Go ahead, John. Uh, this isn't actually about the uh, the nano VNA. I was just curious, in, in the, kind of in the same realm, um, do you have... Uh, expertise and ability to um, do one of these on like rig expert AA55 or something like that. Um, this was way, way above my understanding, um, but I do have, I do make use of the rig expert and I'm just wondering if that would be uh, worth the talk. Yeah, I mean, we can, we could even do it one-on-one, -on -one, John, if you want. I mean, what you've seen on the nano, when we looked at that Smith chart and we were trying to get that thing by turning the, the dials and the crank in the inductor is the same thing you're doing on the rig expert. The rig expert, you're trying to knock your SWR down to low, as low as you can, with a 50 ohm impedance. Same thing with the nano VNA. But the nano shows you is that value you're getting, you know, if you're passing 50 ohms impedance, is it is it inductive adding in there or is it capacitive? So you know, oh, maybe I got to add a couple turns to a coil or maybe I need to add a cap into there. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, so you're doing the same thing with with the uh, the rig expert or with the MFJ two fifty nine or two sixty nine uh, that this is doing. But yeah, yeah, we can do it if you want to go one on one. I'm delighted to do that with you. But uh, I'm not an expert. I'm not an RF engineer. Okay, I'm a retired biomedical engineer or manager and, and and so on. I had a lot of RF troubleshooting or actually RF interference troubleshooting over my thirty six years with Hewlett Packard and others. But but Bob, not an RF you... guy. And, uh, I apologize to the RF engineers because I'm sure they're cringing. Why don't you give your email address out, Bob? Yep, it's k one yankeeoscar at net. Just fire me off in. You know, Thank glad you. to talk anytime. Or if you have any ideas, you want to see some stuff, uh, fire it off, and we'll see what I can do. But we've been kicking these nanos around, and I'm trying to use these two little devices to replace a service monitor of 45 pounds that, you know, you can't buy them easily anymore for under eight or $9,000. And... I want to be able to use these. The nice thing, it's a tool because you have a good function generator or a frequency generator at least in both of them, especially in the ESA. You can do AM, you can do FM if you need to test things. In the nano, you have an antenna analyzer, you have, an, uh, you have a component checker, uh, SWR meter, and a host of other things. I mean, you saw all those lists of what the charts can do. I haven't even scratched the surface, nor does my mind scratch the surface in understanding it. So there's a lot of things you can do and learn on it. So I'll be glad to glad to help any way you guys need. Okay. Any more questions from anyone tonight? Again, K1YO at ARL.net. Um, thank you, Bob, for a, a very informative uh, meeting. It was way beyond me, but I'm not a technical person. Um, I'm sure a few people here uh, understood more, much more than I. And uh, thank everybody for coming out. You can watch the video. Um, what happens is uh, when I close down, it saves to my, uh, my solid state drive. And then I share it through Dropbox to Vanessa, who posts it up on the, uh, the website. So um, okay. you no, can rewatch it again. You can reach out to Bob. And uh, everybody have a good night. Hope to see you all Friday night at the meeting. And um, also see you um, Saturday at the... Uh, Mount Tom Flea. I'm sure they can use snow our support standing, too. Right? What's that? And tomorrow, and tomorrow, tomorrow with the brown <laughs> Anyways, good night, everybody. Good night, guys. Thanks. Thank good you, night. Bob. Thank you, Bob. Seven three, everybody. Bye.